What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Our nature as humans yearns for leaders with integrity, and we're prone to follow those people who promise it. Look at the past and the present. We cry for honest, dignified, humble, and moral people, but are frequently disappointed. What we crave is Christ, believers and unbelievers alike. But why is integrity so important? How does Christ answer that? Join John MacArthur, pastor-teacher of Grace Community Church, as he takes us through 2 Corinthians 5 and shows us the meaning of integrity. The Bible is propositional truth. It is not opinions. It is not suggestions. It is truth from God. And so doctrine defines the Scripture. You could even refer to the Bible as doctrine. But these doctrinal truths that become the structure of our lives come to us in the most natural and simple ways on the pages of Scripture. They're not necessarily tied to great doctrinal treatises in Scripture. They, they pop up in life because they are, after all, the principles that drive life, that power life. And one great doctrine, one massively critical doctrine, one defining doctrine appears in a passage that is very simple, very straightforward, and very personal in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. So turn to 2 Corinthians, if you will, and chapter 5. Chapter 5, wonderful chapter on many accounts. Certainly the closing portion of it is as powerful as any passage on the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. But I want us to look at a passage sort of in the middle of the chapter from verses 11 through 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 15. This is very personal, first-person communication from the Apostle Paul. And just to give you a little bit of background w without taking a lot of time, this entire letter of 2 Corinthians, it's a long letter, is essentially Paul defending himself. He's defending himself as a leader. His leadership is being assaulted and attacked, and it's being attacked by false teachers. And they're attacking the believers at Corinth. They're coming into Corinth, and basically if they want to propagate their lies, if they want to effectively produce um, demonic lies and a satanic kingdom to take over what is the church there, they're going to have to undermine the people's confidence in Paul. Paul is their teacher. He's the one they've trusted. So they begin an all-out campaign against Paul. And they're there for apparently a period of time, and they're attacking him every way possible to destroy people's trust in him, and that then opens them up for accepting some false doctrine from these false teachers. Paul then writes this letter to defend himself. It is the hardest thing he has ever done. He would rather be beaten by rods. He would rather be whipped. He would rather be shipwrecked. He would rather be stoned. He would rather be left in the mountains uh, under the threat of robbers, all of that he talks about in the letter. He, he would rather be involved in any of those kinds of things that threaten his physical life than have to defend himself. This, this is a... This is a very traumatic experience for him because he is a godly man, and godly men are marked by humility, and humility makes it difficult to enter into self-defense, especially a prolonged self-defense like this. Back in chapter 4, he describes himself as a clay pot, nothing more than an earthen vessel, a clay pot in whom this deposit of the glorious gospel has been made. He is a man who, who, who wants to set himself aside, 
who wants to set himself below others, not above, but he is forced to defend himself here in order to maintain his leadership. And as we come to this passage, I want you to see it as that very personal attitude of self-defense in just these few verses among many in this epistle. Let's look at verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf." Paul is a very critical leader in the early church. Essentially, once the gospel goes outside Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, it goes with the apostle Paul so that he becomes the source of planting churches all over the Gentile world. He is a critical leader, and he is every bit a leader. He would be qualified by, by all qualifications of what leaders are and how they function. If we were to ask people today a sort of a, a general open question, what do you think marks leaders? We would get an accumulated list of qualities that would sound something like this. Uh, focus, an unrelenting clarity of task makes an effective leader. We would hear things like drive or energy, a high degree of, um, of motivation. Uh, we would hear the word courage, courage meaning a willingness to face adversity and not break down or back down even though there are threats. We would hear things like goals, somebody who has a strong sense of direction, knows where he wants to go. We would hear knowledge. You're not going to be an effective leader unless you know more than the people who are following you. There has to be a knowledge and a thirst for more knowledge behind effective objective leadership. We would hear about strength, physical stamina. We would hear about optimism, believing in people, believing in plans, believing in objectives. We would hear about enthusiasm, which is a kind of contagious excitement that allows you to collect people as you go who get caught up in that excitement. We would hear about faith. Great leaders, effective leaders are willing to risk. So if we use the word faith in that sense, they're willing to go after something they can't yet see. That would define leadership. We would hear the word enterprise. What is enterprise? I like to think of it as the, uh, the willingness, in fact, the, uh, the anxious attitude that says, I want to tackle the hardest job. It's the ability to take on all the possible difficulties. We would hear about persuasion. Leaders must be persuasive because leadership really involves communication, speech, and you have to be able to articulate and convey your ideas and then convince people to follow you. We would probably hear the word imagination. Good leaders think of things that nobody else thinks of. They, they come up with things that nobody else comes up with. They devise things that others haven't thought of. That's part of leadership. And then after all of those things that sort of operate in a collective way, we would probably want to add the word individualism. Leaders have an uncanny ability to stand alone. They just tend to go against trends and the grain, and if need be and everybody forsakes them, they have the strength to go it by themselves. Now, all of those characteristics I can find in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. Just reading the book of Acts, reading 2 Corinthians and all of the epistles that Paul wrote following his life, they all are characteristic of him. He was an individual who often stood alone confidently. He had a creative imagination about what could be done. He longed for opportunity to start something that had never been done before, churches all over the Gentile world. He could articulate truth like no one else. 
and He could mobilize people under the influence of His persuasive speech. He could gather masses of people. He could, uh, he could move them in the direction that He desired. He was entrepreneurial, always eager to use His enterprising abilities to tackle the most difficult thing. He ran risk after risk. He was contagious. He was enthusiastic. He was optimistic about people and plans, physically strong, enduring tremendous hardship, operating with great energy, high-level motivation, willingness to face adversity, and never break down, back down, even if He faced death, which He did on a daily basis, as He said. He had a sense of direction. His goals were specific. He had the knowledge necessary to accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. So he's a, he's a living model of everything a leader should be in terms of capability and perspective. But with all that, there was something that marked him that really set him apart. It's something that has to mark a leader in the kingdom of God. In a word, it is integrity. It is integrity. We live in the secular world, obviously. We see it with people in the secular world, the business world, the political world. Um, we see these kind of leaders. We see leaders with these characteristics. But we have to come to terms with the fact that the missing ingredient in these leaders is spiritual integrity. We have to cope with that as Christians. That we're dealing with people who have lots of qualities and characteristics and capabilities. But when you are talking about the kingdom of God, all of that has to be held together by integrity, by integrity. And that is what marked Paul. And essentially, that is what he defends in this entire letter, because that's what's under attack. This is the at attribute of character that ties all the other things together and really makes him high impact. What is integrity? It is the, it is the quality of being undivided. It is integer. It is one. It is being true to one's standard. It is, I guess, honesty. It is sincerity. It is incorruptibility. It is the opposite of hypocrisy. The quality of being undivided would be a dictionary definition. And for the Christian, the standard is biblical. For people who are not Christians, they can sort of pick and choose whatever standard they want, whatever moving standard they want, whatever um, popular standard they want. But for believers, integrity is tied totally to Scripture. That was Paul. He lived what he believed, and what he believed was what was revealed by God. He preached what he believed, and what he believed was the Word of God. His life matched his preaching. His life matched his teaching. His life matched his writing. This is the virtue that holds everything in place, and without it, it begins to collapse. Now the enemies of the Apostle Paul, the false teachers, were attacking him on all levels. They weren't necessarily trying to pick apart his theology. They, they, they couldn't do that initially. They would have to undermine his character first. And so they went after that. They went after his spiritual integrity. The greatest, the greatest impact that critics have on anybody who's in the ministry is an assault on their integrity, which then speaks to the critical reality that anybody serving the Lord must maintain personal integrity. The most threatening criticism that came at Paul was against his integrity, that he wasn't who he claimed to be, that he was a fraud and a liar and a deceiver, and a hypocrite. And it is that that he defends here in this letter. In fact, the whole letter is a defense of his integrity. He wanted everyone to know that like David in Psalm 78, 22, he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. 
And for anybody who serves the Lord, a reputation for honesty, sincerity, credibility, incorruptibility is absolutely essential. Paul knows that. If these false teachers can cause people to question His integrity, then everything can collapse, everything. So this letter is written to defend that integrity. And as I said, this is very difficult for Paul, very hard for him, because he is a man of true humility. Now, to enter into this passage and look at what's in his heart is really an open door to this very, very precious man of God. And where this little passage is going to take you is is one of the great journeys that you'll ever take in a brief few verses. Let's begin in verse 11. He makes a statement in verse 11, you'll see it there at the beginning of the verse, we persuade men. That was what He did. That was His calling. That was His life. His whole life was persuading men. We are seeking a positive response from people. That's that's defining. He sought a favorable estimation of His message, supported by a favorable estimation of His character and His person. He wanted people to believe what He preached. He lived for that. That was Him. That was all there was to Him. We persuade men. And that persuasion demands an underpinning character to make a message believable. You can't talk about God transforming lives. You can't talk about God making sinful people righteous. You can't talk about all the transforming power of the gospel unless there is an evident transformed life behind all of that. We persuade men. That, that's His calling. That's what He does. And He uses we because He's, he's in His humility, He likes to bring along others who do the same thing. But He's talking about Himself. It's kind of the editorial we. The verb actually means to seek the favor of, and He uses it the same way in Galatians 1. He sought a favorable estimation of Himself by people, not for His own sake, but for the sake of the message. So He said, there's a sense in which in my ministry, I'm after a positive response from people. At the same time, He says, verse 11, but we are made manifest to God. What people don't know about me, God knows. I'm looking for a favorable estimate from people. I'm looking for a favorable response from people. I will tell you this, something I believe, he says, that I already have from God. We're manifest to God. God knows my heart. God knows my sincerity. Back in chapter 1, verse 12, He said, our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. God knows my heart. My conscience is clear. And by the way, my conscience is activated by the Holy Spirit, and my conscience is informed by the law of God. I have a fully informed conscience and a Holy Spirit-activated conscience, and it is not accusing me. Because in holiness and godly sincerity, we have conducted ourselves in the world and before you. So he's saying, I'm trying to persuade men of the truth of my character and message, something God knows. Something God knows. Now look, he's not saying I've already arrived. We read that this morning, right? In Philippians 3, he said, I haven't attained. In chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, he says, if I know nothing about myself, against myself, if I know nothing against myself here, and am I not justified? I, I don't, I'm not the final court on my own self. Someday when the secrets of the heart 
are revealed before the Lord, then will every man have his praise from God. So he's saying, I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I am saying this, my conscience is not accusing me, and behind my conscience is the law of God, and in my conscience is the Spirit of God, and I'm not being accused. He said the same thing at the end of the book of Acts in chapter 23 and 24, I have a clear conscience. And then he goes a step further and says, and I hope that we're made manifest also in your consciences. I hope you in Corinth church, I hope you know the truth about me. You know me. I was with you. I was with you for a prolonged time. You know everything there is to know about me. Look, my life is to persuade men, to persuade men of a message and the character of the man behind the message. God knows my heart. God knows my integrity. You know my integrity. I, I, I hope that we're made manifest in your conscience. I hope that all those years together convinced you. It's all very important for me because my whole calling is to persuade men. God knows my integrity. You know my integrity. I want everybody to know that I'm a man who lives what I preach. Now at this point, the question arises, why was this man so driven toward integrity? And it's really, I ask the question because he answers it. Why was he so driven? What is behind that kind of integrity? It's a hard thing. It's just a hard thing in the world, the world of unconverted people, to maintain integrity. It's really hard. You've you got to find some motivation for that. And if you're, if you're just living your life in the world, uh, the, the motivations are pretty flimsy, pretty whimsical and passing. But here's a man who is motivated by things in the kingdom of God. We have motivations the world has no knowledge of, none at all. We don't always tap into all of them, but Paul did. He had motivations that were transcendent, motivations that were above the world, motivations that aren't available to the average person. And he gives us four of them. There were four motivations that drove this man in the direction of maintaining complete integrity, being exactly the man He preached. Reason number one, motive number one, reverence for the Lord, reverence for the Lord. Go back to verse 11. This is where He starts, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord. In this case, fear means reverential awe. It means adoration. It means worship. It doesn't mean that he was afraid of God. It doesn't mean that God terrified him. It doesn't mean that he, mean that he saw God as some kind of a, of a threat to him. It's not that. Ephesians 5 says that all of us as believers who are filled with the Spirit function in the fear of Christ. What that means is in the, in the worship of Christ. Romans 3.18, on the other hand, says that in the world there is no fear of God. There is no fear of God. So here we have the, the, the motive for Paul that, that I said is transcendent that nobody in the world has. Nobody does this outside the kingdom of Christ because they worship the true God. That's only possible through Christ. In Acts 9, it says the churches were growing in the fear of God. It means worship. What it's simply saying is this is Paul's mindset, and it is a mindset of admiration. It is a mindset of adoration. It is a mindset of respect, of awe and reverence and worship, which the Lord excited in His mind and in His soul. And the Lord is the sole object, the compelling desire to worship. That's what we read in Philippians. We are those who worship in the Spirit 
and glory in Christ Jesus. John 4, we're the true worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth that God is seeking. He's not afraid of God. He's not threatened by God. He is overwhelmed by God. In fact, a good way to, to understand what he's saying is to take the word knowing at the beginning of verse 11, knowing it's oida in the Greek, and uh, it's, a, it's a simple word, knowing, and yet it's a word that carries with it a, a kind of a nuance. It's translated, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 5.12 by the verb appreciate, and that's a good translation. So what he is saying here is appreciating the worship of the Lord. I appreciate God. I appreciate God. I have a settled appreciation for God. This is a little different than Jonah, for example. Jonah knew the character of God. Jonah chapter 4, he outlines the character of God. He says, I know who you are. I know the kind of God you are. I know the kind of God you are. I know you're a forgiving God, a saving God, and I knew you'd save these Gentiles. That's why I disobeyed you, because I didn't want it to happen. He was, he was basically racist. He didn't want the Gentiles getting in on the blessings of the God of Israel. And so he ran and ended up, you know, being eaten by a fish and great fish and then vomited on the shore and finally had to go and do what God wanted him to do. But it was Jonah's knowledge of God that drove him away from God. It was Paul's knowledge of God that drove him in the direction of God. Paul was no reluctant prophet. He was no reluctant preacher. He knew God was a saving God. He knew God was a merciful God. He knew God was a gracious God. He knew God was a forgiving God. He refers to God our Savior, God our Savior, God our Savior over and over again. He was a worshiper of God. This was His reasonable service. So His life is marked by reverence for God. He holds God, the God, the only true God. The God is revealed in Scripture in awe and honor and respect and realizes His holy glory and desires to give Him the honor that He is due. Now He understood that fearing the Lord is the foundation of a blessed life. Proverbs 9.10 puts it as simply as it could possibly be put, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Paul knew that. He also knew what the Proverbs say. And I went through Proverbs and just looked for this, and, and I found statements in chapter 10 where it says that fearing the Lord literally brings and prolongs life. In chapter 14, the fear of the Lord produces strength and the fountain of life. Chapter 15, the fear of the Lord is better than treasure. Chapter 19, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Chapter 22 of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord leads to riches, honor, and life. Life is summed up in its richest form by fearing the Lord. Why did he pursue integrity this way? Because he was a true worshiper. next week on Grace To You. Why did he pursue integrity this way? Because he was a true worshiper. But he says, if we are beside ourselves, if we go outside the normal boundaries of communication, it's for God. Because I want to give to God the whole heart and soul and body in the proclamation of divine truth. 